him as always. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending from wherever you are joining and uh, listening today. Uh, welcome to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Today for our live open mic on the theme of wings. <laughs> wings. I do actually have a little bird with me today too. <laughs> well, about once a month, we absolutely try to get as many people on reading in one fell swoop, pun intended. And today we have a, a a robust and beautiful lineup of poets joining from many, many places all around the maps, so to speak, and looking forward to hearing new work, old work, emerging work, all on the theme today of wings. And you can be sharing your poem, uh, your own work, or the poetry of someone else on the theme as well. Uh, will be a reminder, each poet will have six minutes for a set. And if we've got time after the first 12, we will certainly welcome uh, getting in a few folks on our waiting list. Uh, like so many of you, I am very, very eager to uh, hear the work. So, uh, you know, let us begin. And uh, just a reminder that if there's, um, you know, if you think that there's, that there's, depending on what you're reading, if there's work that you think um, might need a little bit of a preface and to give a, give a person uh, a little heads up that uh, they might, uh, if, 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 if they might need a little bit of a warning about content, please feel free to do that and uh, be respectful with your sharing. All right, well, first up today, we have, Giulio Madrini, and welcome. I'm so excited to have you here and have you start us off today. Thank Thanks you. for very, coming. Very pleased to be here. My first poem is called Disregarding the Suicide of Gray Birds. And it's dedicated for those flying against injustice over the world. In the former days, before parades of upgrades, selfies, when reality was not entertainment. Gray birds soared under clouds to the limbs, to the nests in continuity and steady flight. Their melodies enchanted the heavens, introduced the sky to the firmament below. In partnership, we witnessed elegance, grace, accepted their generosity in song, purpose, and passion. Those were rare days of secluded memories when pure and effortless song glorified the air, soared in the skies with contentment born of harmony, uplifted in the certainty of colors luminescent in the heavens. The rain fell like any other day when feathers had shown in spontaneous passages, no one noticed the threatening clouds rising over the slate gray sky. A murky haze suffocated the air. Monotony and predictability were projected in our heavens, obscured by noise. In the dreary, desolate days and shadows, unconditional structure replaced the renewal of song. Flight became tedious and there was frightening decadence through the widening abyss, passing in the air without vision, familiarity, or understanding. And the suffering of one 
is not the prerequisite limitation of this terrible day, but developed and shared in violent abandonment. These were the pages from the story of the suicide of gray birds and the slander of nature. We assess the vacancies of discord before us that have invaded our clouds, darkened our world, and become the authors and witnesses of our devastation. Observe these charcoal twisted flights of whim. The futility of conflict assaults our susceptible spirits and suggests we concede to surrender in futility this unbearable constriction attacking our vulnerable hearts. Do not despair, my friends. Inside my gray feathers and yours are brilliant sparkling colors that dwell within our spirits, bequests from those gray birds of old whose legacy was passion and time and growth to lift us beyond our grasp. We know the multicolored song and we will sing it if we are the only birds in the woods. The next one, oh, thanks, Sandra. The next one that I have, you didn't say which kind of wings. This is called, this is a poem I wrote that was inspired by Dante's treatise on language. It's called The Speech of Angels. The shifts of language, clumsy floating variables to share the totality of nature and the stuff of heaven. The interference and meddling gossip of media hurl pillows and panic, congregations of prime time cannibals selling pharmaceuticals. The circus improbability of pageant winners defined as statesmen preach solemnly with thick lips and slender hands. There is no greater eloquence or compelling cognitive thunder than the unspoken visions of the dead. We shared our touch and now it is more a promenade through burden and joy, a triumph of life via death, where the designs of our natural world flower, not in inexpensive words, but sacred bouquets of silence. Our speech in thought and vision, forever defined and everlasting in the now, and the success of this perfect language transformed to the sharing of infinity. I see Nono with his gray vest and white t-shirt. Why does he smile and not laugh to the little boy looking up? His angel assures and articulates his heart and mine. I become the answer to every young riddle that surrounds, that surrounds the bewilderment of a child. His silence is not obscure and it is not finite. It is sweet and shatters complications. In early growing days, I shared a hard firmament with mama and papa, scraped and suffered necessary treaties, endured the venue of voice and were prejudiced by its sound. Near their corporal ends, the material world changed the rules of speech to terrible and hurtful noises but the unmistakable dialogue of their newer angels rescued me from pain and delivered us to a pact of acceptance in the simplicity of love. Now, I talk to mama. She tells me, Julio, I was not afraid. You saw the cancer mask my face. It cannot interfere with us now or forevermore. Papa's angels does not have tremors. He still shaves with a straight razor, has a garden that everyone admires. He speaks as before in stuttering excitement, and I am glad as these are his ways. I recognize my beloved father when he explains to his friends, 
This is my son. In absence, they are not silent. I cannot miss my angels and they cannot miss me. Find your angels for they have been waiting and wait for you still. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Well, just heard from Giulio Madrini. And uh, yes, a reminder, there are many, many ways to interpret wings. We invite them all in and thank you for starting us off with that, the, that prismatic way of looking at the theme for today. Thank you, Sam. Great start for our live open mic here. And next we have Mary Louise Kiernan followed by Bill Nevins. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, Julio, that was very powerful. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank Sandra, Kim and Don. And I have two poems today to read from my debut collection. It's the gift of glossophobia and glossophobia is the fear of public speaking. And in my case, the fear of voicing my opinion. So I have two poems that are in the collection to read to you today. And the first one is titled Making the Cut. And I was told by a few very serious people that it was not a serious enough poem to include in my collection, but I followed my own voice and decided to include it anyway. And the epigram is from Mary Oliver. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Making the cut. The air a sea of creatures, horse flies and zigzagging birds, clipping crisscross glinting electric wires that skip rope with the sun. The scent of sappy evergreen engages my sense of seasons to come. While I sip coffee ice and the sunlight simmers on my polished toes. Treasure the memory of this day against the underside of the fall before winters hurry to the door. Don't let the cold in days for sure on their way. No, 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 no one can steal this surge from me to stop the bloodletting and start my healing. Thank you. The second poem was drafted first during an Omega Institute workshop led by the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Sharon Olds. And this poem actually became the winning entry in the adult poetry category for a Tempe Library Poetry Prize that was co-sponsored with Arizona State University. The title is No Dwelling. My high on the hill home must be multiply listed with no time to rue. I resolve myself like the persistent sparrow, mourning its egg-filled nest, knocked from above the front door cornice. Bewildered, the bird shuddered midair, its wings backpedaling furiously in place. How fast can a bird's heart beat before bursting? Quelling my own palpitations, I will mirror the ways of the winged one that rebuilt its nest, flight after flight after flight, meshing leaves and twigs with mossy mud, then weaving in a single strand of my child's hair, loosened during a porch side hairbrushing. How fast can my own heart beat before soaring? Thank you. Mary Louise, I'm glad you did not take heed of that advice and included those poems. The first poem, absolutely. Someone was with you and uh, listening, 
and and uh, supporting you, your own voice uh, in including them. Thank you for sharing. Great to have you with us today. And uh, I look forward to hearing more poems from the new collection. Yeah, thank you. All right, well next, I never know where Bill Nevins is joining us from. So <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's always a wonder and a mystery and always great to have um, you with us in the open mic. Uh, so we'll hear from Bill Nevins and Matt Mooney will be on deck, so to speak. Thank you, Sandy, it's an honor. Uh, we're here, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Headset. Uh, we're here at approximately 10,000 feet elevation in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of uh, New Mexico and in my car because I get a better reception up here. Um, I'm going to read uh, you six minutes of my own poems. Here they go. Um, this one is called Awe. It is dedicated to my love, Jeannie, and uh, to the Sand Hill Gray Cranes of New Mexico. Circling in here, spiraling down, careful now, got to lower the legs, hold the wings, steady, turn the feathers down, so down, just so, mind the trees, hey, watch the bushes for coyotes, crazy people, fierce bears, a mama elk defending her calf, ah, uh, yeah, touching ground, ah, uh, yeah, touching down, ah, uh, yeah, your arms wrap around, ah, uh, yeah, land. Never quite imagined in my bird brain I could be here, this dear place, never saw that far ahead. Circling so long, spinning mind, spinning heart, spinning dizzy for all the mad view you know. We land, we do, just so. Feather. Bed. Icarus in the Forever War from Matt Ho and Keith Sherman. He loved the wild sky, wanted to fly. He fell out of our time, left us behind. His true love parachutes under African sun. He, her dreams of him haunt hills of Afghanistan. Steel magnolia heroes tumble to a political maze. Impatient patriot families count endless mission days. A loyal sister pitches her gold star flag in Alaskan aurora borealis glow. As another sister circles female hearts below. In the moon and stars turn, wishing for his return. While his mom misses no wreath lay war jet salute. Roaring over his cold Colorado grave. Soldiers do as told. Generals let them die. We sheep comply. Maybe our new president will end this waste, restore calm, get us back to the good old days before Vietnam. On Memorial or Vets Day or the 4th of July, we silently salute. Few dare ask why. His father piles rocks in a cairn under blue sangre de Cristo sky, searches for fallen feathers, soaks desert ground with tears and whiskey. When his own boy's waxed wings failed, Daedalus did not cry. He had hard grief puzzles, tangled mazes, and leather wings to try. <clears throat> this one's called Over the Rainbow, uh, prefaced by Merle Haggard. Silver wings shining in the sunlight, roaring engines headed somewhere in flight. They roared over afterburners blazing, bold aerial cotillions, middle of a quiet sangre de Cristo lazy day when we'd been cutting wood, watching deer, or just being civilians. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, our brave aerial guardians at play. Shit, those shiny new F-35 jets cost billions. Some say it's just a training exercise, and we should be glad. Afghanistan, you see, has mountains like these, lad, and we're protected, enjoying sweet safety in the land of the free, home of the high-flying brave, wings of freedom, you see. Taliban ain't got no air force, that's for damn sure, Jack. Raise your eyes to the contrails and whisper the pledge, Mac. Them need-taking, peace-freak commie queers got a hell of a nerve. And watch your own back, buddy. Fucking hell, did you serve? Maybe it's just overeducated liberal me, but combat fighters crashing the air above just don't make me feel comfy, you see. Too much like Ganica in my eyes. Too many kids, too many of them, too many of us who died. Napalm, 
white phosphorus Stuka dive bombers, Russian flying tank Heinz, B-52s to Raptor drones, the glorious sonic blast of death in babies' minds, caskets draped in flags, charred bodies tossed in the ditch. Does it really matter which is which? They say, get with a program, mate. Liberty don't come cheap, and it's never too late. Shed some patriot tears, savor the boom, stick some red, white, and blue cotton in both ears, crack a few beers, strain your neck, shield your eyes, put a stake on the grill and spell the burn there, freedom blasting in on its fierce silver wings, bright hopes, a holy American prayer. This one is Silence of the Messengers. We hear only hush of wings, these angels who sweep around us, never a word spoken, never a sword drawn, though their voices be strong, the hearts brave, knowing that we would not remember if they spoke, would not remember one soft word, nor recall one fiery blow. So we greet them only with heart beats, as is the way of this unknowing mind. Fall lightly, a party piece for nobody, indeed. This poem is not me. This flag may be fancy, but it ain't my worry if I fall. Don't fret. This text is not you, too. We can fly free in this song that the uncaged bird sings. This go round, forget your parachute. Use your wings. It's like that eerie December concert when Miles Davis turned his princely back on us, holding one delicious aching note for what seemed all night long, then left the stage, whisked out of sight as we silently filed out to a bleak, snowy night. Michelangelo's Roman steps descend like a river without end. Yet, Ranier Wilke, from his deep diving heart, reminds us that everything serious is difficult. Poetry strives in craft not far from the occult. Yet, were it easy to find solitude together? As easy, perhaps, as sex, war, or death can be? Or were it as easy as it is to fall backwards into a rushing mountain stream, then we might tumble, laughing, wings unfurled, past rapids, fierce rocks, currents curled, until we dream drift alone and free forever to that moon-tugged, rolling sea. Gracias. Gracias. Bill Nevins. The book is Awe, from Awe. Show that book to us. We got to hear in the New Book Showcase last year when it had first come out. Um, amazing collection. I have it back here with my collections. Thank you so much, Bill. Next, we move on to the ever, the, the ever flight worthy, Matt Mooney, followed by Phil Lynch. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. Uh, I think um, my video has stopped. I think, I think I may not be on video. We see you. Can you see me? Yep. No, oh, that's okay. I'm live, so on video, that's okay. Um, I'm going to read four poems four short poems, and uh, two of them are, are um, I've been around for a while and, and, I, and, uh, and I have not published them, they remain unpublished. And two are new ones. And um, maybe, maybe the theme is hidden somewhere in them, but they're not quite obvious in, a lot, in, in, the, most, in the, the most of them, but you'll see yourself. The first one is called Stargazing. Our love flies excitedly like dandelion blooms fly in the summer air, free as the honeybee, 
seeking nectar busily, or blossom to blossom, pollinating them. Our love is finally cut, a diamond fashioned. Now it's set in silver next to a golden band. A secret sparkling star, man-made for lovers. Aura of ethereal light illuminating us. And the second poem is entitled Promenading. Three ships are anchored off Torvieca, and I sit on the prom in an outdoor cafe, watching walkers and hawkers parading. Seagulls on the rocks on routine patrol. Around the tables, sparrows hunt crumbs. A young couple barefoot skimming along on the prom on a fine summer's morning. Walking on water, the proud mother-to-be. Then a man in shorts and a formal felt hat drives by on his red motorized wheelchair. His wife by his side strives ever so vigilant. And here's a young lady looking so elegant, lifting the hem of white lace of her dress to deftly shine up her designer's sunglasses. On their toes, defying the roll of the waves, teenagers play ping pong on the shoreline. The three ships out at sea are sailing away. The next poem uh, is called Writing in the Sky, and it's set in the stone. Silhouetted in the square, the pencil pointed spire of St. John's Arts Theatre soars out of leafy trees, rising higher and higher over all the chimney pots, sitting high the hotel end, to write an alleluia of joy across the rosy afterglow of an evening in early May. And the final one, It's very new. When dreams are spun, dark haired, slow eyed angel of the night, you appear to me, arms outstretched, reaching up, hands clasping tight behind, not quite embracing me, but face to face with everything I craved but had no right. I held you in the dream, not mine to take. Our looks were truly locked in later lines. And I said, to live your love life to the full, and not to mind the way I am about you. I'd be happy just to see you come and go spinning through space across the moon until again another dream of you is spun. Tenderly you asked if my heart felt pain. At times, seeing things you say and do as your story unfolds in the book of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. And Matt will be reading next month in the New Book Showcase with us uh, in November, I believe. Yes, if I'm, much. yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, we move on 
to Phil Lynch join and following Phil will be Kellyanne Parker. Thanks to the both of you. Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much, Sandy, and hi to everyone, <clears throat> wherever you are, whatever time it is. Um, I'm going to start uh, four as well. Hopefully I'll get through them. I'll just set the timer to keep I don't draw now. But anyway, first one is called Footprints. My thoughts are chirping birds, but all the wings are broken. The will cannot find the way. The child is now a man and all the glory fades. All I ask is for the storm long since started to be ended, for this restless soul to strike a steady beat. I want to skim across calm waters to reach the safer shore from where I can look back in impish celebration like the child who jumped across the stream and looked behind at the footprints he had left. Um, this second one, all the, most of these poems are of a certain vintage like myself, uh, and this one in particular, um, because I wrote it uh, over 50 years ago, um, just after, not too long after the first moon landing. Um, so I say that intentionally because it dates it and me as well, but um, it, was, it was written as a futuristic piece at the time. Um, and I like to think it still is. So I like to take any excuse I get to read it. Um, and it was written just to put it in context at a time when I suppose, according to the West, China was the big threat that was going to communize us all. Um, Peking was still Peking, so Beijing, um, computers and modern communication systems uh, weren't too much heard of, neither were, was the idea of civilian space travel, at least it wasn't, hadn't become a common thing. And all of these things are still in their infancy, I think, anyway. So this is called progress. The main course is finished and the family proceeds to the orchard. For dessert, they eat the ripening fruit from the trees. Beneath them, the 2 p.m. train streaks through. Father rushes to his private plane, shouting, I'm late. Over the TV controls, he calls, I won't be home for tea, dear. He is flying to Peking for an important meeting with the lunar ambassador to discuss business prospects. The 6 p.m. flight from Cape Mao, formerly named Cape Kennedy, is delayed because of a dust storm in Moon Seho. Due to the extended strike by computers, concern continues to grow in New York as to the amount of food left in their storeroom one, a quiet place once called the British Isles, but uninhabited since the afternoon of the last war. Latest reports say the minor famine in Europe is easing. Only two million have died since noon. Meanwhile, the building up of the planets proceeds the plan being to inhabit the latter and to recultivate the entire earth. This may be somewhat delayed by the forthcoming war expected to decrease the population by half. Nevertheless, the great universal progress continues. <clears throat> this one is um, I suppose it's kind of wingy, but it's probably more about the absence of wings than the presence of them. Anyway, it's called disconnected. They're out of reach now. The hands that held and clasped felt their way through touch and grip, gone in a confusion of waves beyond the bottom of the sky. No tap of fingertips on far off keys, no image flashed on screen from distant lenses, can bridge the gap, can match the perfect imperfections of the touch, the feel, the grasp of hands we can no longer hold. So I'll just finish this one, which has sort of wings of a kind in it as well. And it's, um, I lived um, for a good, uh, a long time ago, but for a good few years in, in Belgium and Brussels and uh, backing onto our house virtually was a, a, a large wooded area. And it was said at the time it had extended in previous 
millennia or whatever, as far as Paris. So anyway, be that as it may, it was full of owls. Or, and at night when we would sit out our back, we would hear the owls hooting. And we figured they were having lots of fun in the wood. And we were having our own bit of fun to inspire this. It's called Night Owls. The cooling heat still sweetened by the residue of berries steeped in Cointreau. The lingering scent of flowers sleeping through the few dim hours of quiet. Owls in nearby woods, said to once have stretched as far south as Paris, give periodic hoots, sounding half apologetic for their disturbance. Still outside, night owls in our own world astride a garden seat. The owls in the wood can hoot all they like. Right now, we don't really give one. Thank you. I love that. I love that ending. Thank you, Phil Lynch. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, we move along. The nice thing about the open mic is I have to keep it moving along. So um, I just am, I, I get to just read names a little bit and you don't have to hear me pontificate about poetry so much today. Uh, we move on to Kelly Ann Parker, followed by Lenora Good. Welcome to the both of you. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to read two pieces from my upcoming chapbook called Down the Foggy Streets of My Mind. I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and the first is a little celebration of sun magic. It's called The Voices of My Ancestors. It's a casual conversation between the hummingbird and I, the cheerful scolding I enjoy. Oh, the crow has his opinions and I give full audience to his complaints. The crow, my fellow traveler, the turkey vulture, my guide, the parrot, my grandmother, the oak trees, my roots. Anchored deeply into golden hills, these living phoenixes are cleansed by the sun to protect me from night. And we talk all day and night, the voices of my ancestors, talking and singing, cooking and creating. My grandma Lupe stirs the pot. She holds my hand and stirs and hums. The smell of lemon tea, the sounds of slipper shuffling are to me the sound of safety. And I found entry in the in-between space, this space of invisibility where I'm not alone, an astral traveler, here a welcome resident, Outside the busyness of business, I convene with the dead. To see them, you must slow down, step off, let go. Here you have to listen, here there is no status quo. Death is the beautiful equalizer, a Venn diagram of then and now. Here, green paper means nothing. Back in the eternal, I am the conduit. And if you want to find home, find your ancestors. Look into my eyes and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, the second one, um, by the name you'll it doesn't need to more explanation. This is called Traumaversary Feast. On this shortest day, in this place that I do not belong, I see wings clipped, feathers plucked, birds made flightless before flight and uses will to create lift to escape just before. On this shortest day, I send light under wings, make light, make lightness, make lighter and loftier before fleeing unseen and revealed in lunar luminescence. Stepping into alternate realm, watching and waiting. 
waiting for a sign of safety, waiting for my human greed card, waiting for an invitation that never comes, never comes. Lunar light like tidal push, pull, beckons and repels, promises and poisons, reveres and repulses, so visceral, vain and violent as only deities can do. Wonderful, wonderful reading. Kellyanne Parker, thank you for being with us today and uh, for that sun magic. Mm. Mm. Well, next, Lenora Good will be joining us, is, is joining us, not will be, is joining us. And uh, so looking forward to, uh, it's just amazing what, what everyone is um, bringing forth from the theme. This is what's so fun about uh, when, we, when we choose that word and, and see what you all manifest. Thank you so much, everyone. Lenora Good will be followed by Mick Meza. Thanks, Lenora. So good to have you. Thank you, Sandy. It's good to be here. I have two poems. The first one is brand new. Uh, my One of my sisters of the heart has just received a not very good diagnosis. And this poem is in answer to that. No wings of wax. I know it's hard, sis, for you to run up against that damn wall when your word abandons you and you stop cold in your verbal tracks when the word you want is on the other side. There is no door or ornamental gate for you to find, to go through, no way for you to uncover that word. Sometimes I know it. And if I say it, you'll happily accept my offering. But if it's the wrong word, not the one you want, you know that too, and just get more frustrated. You need wings, sis. Wings to help you get over that wall, wings to carry you higher toward the sun, but wings of muscle and bone and tendon. No wax of wings for you. How do we grow those wings? Wings with enough strength and power to take you over the wall to that lake, that river where all your lost words swim among the cattails and the cormorants. You, for whom words have always been your friends, become more and more bereft when they leave you, tease you, say neener neener, make ugly faces, ugly sounds, and hide behind that wall. They have found that non-existent gate, door, passage to the other side. Why won't one of them show you? Why won't one of them go slowly so you can follow? Why is God so cruel in his humor? How do we grow wings for you? Wings for me too, so we can go together, neither of us alone. My second poem is from my new book called The Bride's Gate and Other Assorted Writings, a modern eclectic reader for modern eclectic readers. It's a short poem. A mantilla of crows. Hoarfrost coats the bare winter branches with fine fairy lace, making them delicate ladies of pure complexion. As one, a hundred crows light on the lace-covered shoulders of a solitary tree. Before I can raise my camera, the mantilla lifts itself and moves to drape a nearby tree in the majestic beauty of black on white Spanish filigree. I love how you hold the book up. <laughs> Beautiful. I, if, I've discovered if you've got one of these virtual backgrounds, if you put it on your nose, it shows. It, it, is, it is perfectly aligned, perfectly aligned. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lenora, for joining us today. And um, thank you for letting me read. The wings for the four sisters, for sisters, for all the sisters out there today. Thank you. We're sending a lot of good energy out into the world this evening, afternoon, morning, my friends. I thank you. We're cannot be enough uh, healing energy. Well, we will move now to Mick Meza, and then following Mick will be Larry Kirshner. Welcome. Hello, how are you? Um, I'd like to acknowledge the past, present, and future elders of the Wurundjeri Nation on whose land I reside here in Australia. And um, this is a warm up. I've had two poems. This is a warm up. What is love? A four letter word. If has two. And if you feel it, it is. Did you rise with the sunflowers, right? Following the light, light daily. Did you turn on the power to shine on smiling? Did you follow the hour and the bird sings out of the clock? Did you enjoy the view from the tower of the carnival troop dance hop? Did your words fall from the shower for me to clean and embrace the writer in you and me live in a dark place to tunnel from the darkness into its power? Where the words magnify and electrify then turn away like the sunflowers. And what is love a four letter word? If has two, and if you feel it, it is. Next one's from, um, a book that started, it's got a Spanish title. It's called, Tu crees que Dios me ama? Do you believe God loves me? And it was published in a, in a children's book, but that was called Leo's Road to Football. But this one is the poem that it came from. Taking a stroll on the beach with my eldest son, we come across children playing football, as kids often do, just want to have fun. And Junior asks, can we join them? And I recall as a child, I often do befriend anyone. This is what it's like when you're young. And remember as a ch child playing with friends and family, sometimes in the street, at the park, or on my own, I was the smallest of all, kicking a soccer ball. Interrupted by mum and dad calling us home, spoiling our time, playing with anyone. This is what it's like when you were young. Dad was frustrated. We'd come in late, so he took us to the Grand Yoli Football Club where he mentored us, mentored us to play it right, playing with Lucas and Antonella, cheering us on. We'd run forever kicking goals. We were guns. This is what it's like when you're at, we're young. Then it happened, was asked to try for the city's number one team when the coach saw me, thought I was a fragile little dwarf, like a, an illusionist. I waved my magic and nutmegged him. He was so impressed, he accepted. Then my career blasted off. Dream of playing in a large stadium, scoring a tonne. But this is what it's like when you were young. With mum and dad working, training commenced early, and Anna would accompany me to the football ground. It was a 15 minute bus ride where we, when we finished, she would spore me fruit sandwiches or the Italian biscuits she was renowned for. I had Nana to myself for a few hours a day. It was one on one, but this is what it's like when you were young. I told her of the bullies at school stirring me about my height, and she'd hug me and tell me to play with Lucas because he was great. After I ate, I'd lay on lap. And I'd slowly drowse. She'd pray to God and let Leo grow normal like everyone else. And she always said I was a special grandson. But this is what it's like when you're young. We trained for love. We played for joy. We were the machine of 87. I scored nearly 500 goals while I was there. Surely this was, this was heaven. Nana didn't see them all, but I dedicate them to her. Point my finger to the sky saying, this one's for you. God shouldn't have taken my beloved Nana, when I was young, this is what it's like when you were young. I was diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency. Dad's insurance lasted for a few years. Then she asked the club for a contribution. They agreed, then reneged. So he asked the super club in the capital city. They blamed the nation's economic collapse. My father had no solution. Dad was aggrieved and upset for his talented son. But this is what it's like when you were young. My spotty resume was resumed. Reviewed by Barcelona, contract signed on a napkin. Club would treat me. Re relocating a flat near the stadium, also caught up with the relatives in Catalonia. What a journey, successful in my tri trials. My old club would never not release me. I still played in non professional matches. I thought I was done, but this is what it's like when you're young. Sometime later, 
family retained to Rosario, I was left on my own. I stopped talking, just adhered to drills like an insect drone. Solo, solo teammates would scream out at training. The impact that crumpled the skin and stalled the engine, no one noticed because with muscle memory I had overcome. But this is what it's like when you were young. Season ended, back with the family, stopped praying and began talking. Met up with Lucas and Antonella, the colour of her eyes, I was mesmerised. Went to, we went together. We went out together. That's when I began serenading the Bell of Gra Gra Grandioli, the Rose of Rosario. I filled my heart with perfume. I returned to Spain with a scent of love. Still highly strung, but this is what it's like when you're young. I've been asked to play for three countries and only belong to one. My club, clubs, many clubs have tried to poach me and only belong to one. Many women have made advances and only belong to one. I've lived on my own since I was young, the solo one. My career is football, it's the only one. This is what it's like when you're young. Now, on the beach, I play with children. History on repeat. The children tire out and we say goodbye. The young lad and I read on social media. Tells his mum he had just played football with Lionel Messi and she replied, who is he? And he says, oh, mum, but that's what it's like when you were young. Thank you, Mick, joining us from the early, early, early morning. And we next welcome my neighbor down the street. I'm so glad you're here, Larry. Welcome. And following Larry Kirshner will be, let me double check my list. My apologies, friends. I got lost in my queue. Here we go. Following Larry will be Ann Tweedy. So great to have both of you who've been with us for since the early okay. days reading. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Sandy. I have four uh, short poems that uh, touch on our winged companions. First one is called Both Ducks. Both ducks stick their bills into the brown stones and mud, seeking food in the garden space, one bird waddling behind the other. Winter's paralysis finally easing Small green buds poke through the dirt. Some worms lie on the surface with all the recent heavy rain. Wild geese fly north overhead, ignored by our two who are sure that all they need is here. And a, a few years ago, Todd Marshall was the uh, poet laureate of Washington State, and he wanted to celebrate the 129th anniversary of Washington being a state and called for submissions. He got 2,000 submissions and picked 129 to be in the book. And this was one of the ones that he picked. It's called The Bee Dancer. The roof line is set. The new bee hut is square and level, open faced to the southeast. When the bees arrive in a few weeks, I shall dance a bee dance of welcome. By April, my bare feet may be able to raise some dust where now there is mud. Intoning a poem about bees, my fat belly jiggling over skinny legs, I will attempt to waggle appropriately to show them the way. This one is called Low Tide. At Saltwater State Park, searchers armed with steel fork and mythic clam gun, thick as sandpipers dance on the edge, seeking their limits between the gray wet beach rocks and the milky blue water, the wind whips little white caps into the fog. Fat rain is ignored in the frenzy of the hunt. Gulls and crows circle flying low, seeking the broken and discarded. And 
Let's see. I have one more in here. This one is called Targets. The gray blue heron flew low. The thin white stream expelled from above may have surprised the two black crows fighting over a clam on the beach below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Always, always great to have you join us with your poetry. Uh, again, I, I have the good fortune to, Larry is one of the poets that read in only the second reading we, I was able to host in person at our favorite little bookstore in Chehalis. And uh, oh yeah, so thank you so much. Next, we have Ann Tweedy joining us, and I'm so glad to see you today, Ann. I hope you're well. And following Ann will be Kim Ports Parsons with a poem, at least one, that I, I have had a little preview of, and I'm so excited to hear it. Thanks to the both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and I wanted to follow Mick's lead and mention that I'm on the unceded lands of the Ponca, Omaha, Santee, and Yankton peoples. Um, so I thought I'd start with the poem from my full-length book, The Body's Alphabet, um, that I was inspired to read by um, Kim's poem, Love, Bird, Love, Comma, Birds, that I think she may be reading. This is called Fruit. Think of how the body labors, day in, day out. It does its difficult work. Take, for instance, the man who tucked himself against the underbelly of a plane to get out of Cuba. His body fought to keep warm in the frigid reaches. Most hearts would have stopped, but his pumped his arteries all those cold miles, saying, go on, go on, saying, I'll do this work now, undaunted by tomorrow. In my yard, a birdhouse sat atop a hole. A pair of chickadees squeezed their plump bodies in and out of the small hole. One afternoon, we found the birdhouse lying on the ground. With no nest in sight, my husband propped it on the base. A few days later, it fell again. This time, a small rectangular nest sat upright in the grass. This time, Oops. inside four speckled eggs, scarcely larger than jelly beans. This time after setting the nest in place, we tied the house back on. Every day since I've looked for the chickadees, thinking how the body of the female used every whit of excess vitamins and protein of high strong bird energy rested from flying and seed gathering to form the tiny eggs her magnum stretched to accommodate. Meanwhile, she and her mate gathered and pulled wisps of straw, moss, and dry plant stems to thread together a shelter. At last, her vagina squeezed out the eggs and her whole body vigorously warmed them, all on a chance, the same thin chance we all reach for. And um, this one is another wings poem, but my last poem doesn't have anything to do with wings. This one's called Quiddity. I've done the genetic tests, traced my origins to Northwest Europe, the British Isles. No real surprises, though I'd wanted to be more Scottish, more mystical Celt than blunt German. Funny the disjunct between what we are and how we imagine ourselves. Lately, all that seems long forgotten. I feel more Ave than hominid. Looking down, I half expect skinny reptilian legs, forked claws, to be the tiger lily flash of Oriole dipping down for grape jelly. How it lands on top of the vertical circular feeder, carefully looks about, then jumps to the lower rung and tips like a teapot the throat of the dick sissel throbbing with song on a fence post, a miniature vessel sometimes blessedly oblivious to my peering, the endless shutter snaps my pointer finger enacts. Wagnuka, the red-headed woodpecker who belongs to no one and prefers the barkless snags that protect its young from snakes. 
or the male bobolink whose spring coat looks drab when it first grows in until the feather ends grind off to reveal the dreamy reverse tuxedo, the blonde cap who is guided by Earth's magnets because iron oxide inhabits its nasal bristles and olfactory bulb. I, I tell you, I am more feather than hair, more sharp beak than soft lips, more angled oval than straight up and down. The flight in my heart wants to migrate across great oceans through tedious effort, sweat, muscle, wind lift. And then finally, um, I wanted to close with a poem um, about my experience with breast cancer. It's called Rogue Cells. I wanted to keep my diseased breast. For one, I didn't want to lose feeling in it. <clears throat> Other reasons, the foreign implements required for complete reconstruction, and that I simply liked breasts and couldn't stand to think of lacking one. Mostly, I was glad to know for once what I wanted, to not have to follow my usual dance of asking several divergent people for advice, then painstakingly weighing it. A surgeon from whom I'd sought a second opinion insisted that with small breasts, I needed a full mastectomy, and also threw out as an afterthought that it would reduce chances of recurrence. I'm thankful that in my darkest moments, I could see that my stubborn will became indomitable. I would wanted to face death with equanimity, but in retrospect, I like what I got instead, the sudden knowledge of how to be my own best friend. The, the sensation is less than I expected. That breast is mostly numb in spots and four and a half years later dislikes pressure. A feeling between ache and sharp pain if I try to cuddle in the wrong position or a cat steps there. It's a sad thing, but I don't think much about it. Just part of the truth of not being able to go back anywhere, of the ubiquitousness of loss and how it's cumulative. So we have less and less as we go on. I watched my father die last year of another cancer. He was frail and weak and needed help to get to the bathroom and back to the couch. Once I broke down during his stay at a rehab center and his wiry arms held me, his ribby chest that had for decades been well padded. His port stuck me like a pill vial protruding from his body. I resented its wedge entry point for poison we all hoped his numbers would be high enough to allow him to be hooked into. Let his body be healthy enough to take it so we can have him with us longer. He was a complicated person, but in that moment, we were desperate for him. When I got another lump this spring, I saw myself in my father's place and felt nauseous. And I could hear again the rude doctor and understood finally why an old friend now dead of a car crash had gotten a double mastectomy after discovering cancer in one breast. The lump turned out to be nothing, but still the oncologist in South Dakota seems more worried than my old one in Seattle. You're so young, she says, you need to keep taking hormone dis disruptors for as long as possible because having had a positive node, you're of indeterminate risk. The one in Seattle had said five years of pills was fine and it wouldn't be too bad to stop earlier. The change in doctors has made me feel like a ticking time bomb. So I'm left to be comforted by the fact that nobody really knows. I'm the same person and shouldn't get caught up in one doctor's level of optimism versus another's but a void is an odd place, is an unlikely place for a foothold. Thank you. And thanks so much for sharing poems with us today and see everything in the chat, um, sending lots of support to you. And uh, of course, we always appreciate hearing your poetry. Always, always. All right, for the official open mic of the 12 readers, 
Our next reader is Kim Ports Parsons, and then we're gonna hear from Don Krieger, and we will get to some folks in the open mic. They'll, we'll get you read, folks in the open mic, you'll be able to read one poem um, in, on those of you reading on the wait list, and we'll, 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 get, we'll get you folks who've requested in. So thank you, Kim, you'll be next, thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Wow, that was amazing, Anne. Yeah. And the the this week, um, a poem of mine came out in Cider Press Review, and and I'm and Anne um, read it and said, "Oh, it reminds me of a poem of mine." And I said, "Oh, please send it to me." And and it was just another example for me about the warmth and and connection in this amazing community. And Sandy, how much you um, have helped that to happen uh, in, in CVLP. And, and so I will share this uh, poem that we made the connection with. It's called Love Birds. Um, and I, for those of you who might have heard it before, I'm sorry to repeat, but I mean it. Despite their best efforts, a pair of young bluebirds aren't succeeding with their first nest. They've chosen a house my husband built for others, a kind of lean-to for robins, phoebes, and song sparrows. The phone is ringing at my house. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and let it stop and just pause what I'm doing. I'm sorry, I can't. I apologize. I thought that was a line, the way that you said it. The phone is ringing at my house. The phone is ringing. So, okay, if it's all right with everyone, I'm just going to start that again. It's we can over. all actually write a poem, first line. The phone is ringing at my house. <laughs> I challenge you all come back. We'll have it. We'll have an open mic. We'll have an open mic. Oh, of oh, this is what you get with technology, right? I had to come closer to the router, but it also put me next to the telephone where I would never usually be. So, okay, we're going to try again. Love birds. Despite their best efforts, a pair of young bluebirds aren't succeeding with their first nest. They've chosen a house my husband built for others, a kind of lean-to for robins, phoebes, and song sparrows. Only three sides, an open floor, a slanting roof, a space exposed. So each beginning is easily dismissed by wind. My early love affairs were like that, but oh, that swoon of blue. She gathers dry grasses. He stands guard on the barbecue. Here is a, hers is a cup of possibility, of hope, so fragile. It never fails to make me smile when a male cardinal at the theater delivers a seed to a female with what appears to be a kiss. So I should greet you each day. What good does it do to chastise ourselves as years pass for our lack of bright feathers? Perhaps my memory fails me, but wasn't it, wasn't it a barred owl we heard that first weekend we spent making love? I recall starting a poem, a love note really, about calling out for my heart's desire. Each night this June, we hear the whippoorwill insistent, tireless, randy. Sometimes he is so loud we have to close the windows to sleep. When we wake, I curve my body in gratitude and feather my fingers through yours. I suggest that perhaps you could attach a small addition to the platform, like an arm to hold the nest. It would be easy to cut a piece of scrap and tack it on. Sure, you say, and go out to your woodshop and get to work. <laughs> and that is for my dear husband, Doug. This is a new poem, October's Wings. 
There's work to be done before we're through. Monarchs to memorize, spinning over cloth of asters and thistles. Words to string like apple slices and store against winter's coming cold. Dahlias to fondle, hanging on like love, bending under passion's weight and will to live. Words grow inside us before we're made. Monarchs scatter when we approach. Hurried spiral dance until they're gone. There's work to be done before we're through. Laden table for my dreaming mind. Mounds of red sumac and honeysuckle wine. Words like kindling, braced, bracing November's wall. Mm. Wings open inside us before they show. Mm. Great Thank you. Song. Great to be with you today. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kim. And of course, uh, I know everyone here uh, sends out also appreciation for all the support you provide to the Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, indeed. So thank you and helping to make the community broader always. All right, next, again, another, you know, uh, another of our anchors here. Um, we couldn't do the work. We couldn't be together every Sunday without Don Krieger. Uh, and uh, always, always good when we get to hear Don's poems here. And then we will head to the, the wait list and get some poems in off of that. All right, Don, thank you. Thanks, Sandy, and thank you, Kim. I could hear those poems over and over every week, no problem. I have one poem for you. It's in this book. <clears throat> the barbarism and corporate madness of intercollegiate athletics continues with the Big Ten's return to play every September. Sparrow Generations. Brown offered a full ride on my tennis, MIT on academics. Even then I knew I want to learn in college. I have a choice. Chris Dolman, Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, the lucky athletes who soared to glory. Their generations passed through Pitt Stadium right outside my office window. I marveled as the Coliseum was demolished and one early morning at the end when no one else was looking, the facade with the entrance gate fell, the last grand relic to come down, broke the street and the sewer beneath and I finally understood that choice I made at 16. Now it's an event center, the peat, glass and concrete, food mall and Wi-Fi, Judas Priest and basketball, Foo Fighters, hockey, Disney on ice. Sometimes I ride up the escalator, mostly I walk outdoors through the hedges, alive with birds, feral cats and groundhogs. Either way, you can't miss that vaulted interior, limitless ceiling, video wall like the side of a house, sports news constantly running, pictures of trophied athletes displayed in locked cases like numbered Audubon prints or rare baseball cards. In the morning, I pass by the gym even at six, there are students on the treadmills, boys fit and massive, beautiful, girls fit and beautiful too. I see them on campus with their teammates, lounging and laughing, bruised and braced, casts and crutches. 
Often a bird strikes the peat windows in flight, then lies still on the concrete till the janitor comes. Sometimes I carry one back to the hedges when it's been days. Last week I saw a sparrow by the glass wall, standing on the concrete like a statue, even when I knelt beside it. I touched his belly, urged him, step up. He hopped over my finger, then turned and flew onto my hand. The life and quickness in that tiny body, the bright trust of a stranger. I slowly stood and walked him up to the hedges, urged him once more, and he flew free on to his own life. John Krieger, my friends, um, from the book, let's show it, Discovery, one more time here, there it is. Thank you, thank you. Well, we're going to go to the waiting list. Uh, one poem from each of the next four folks. Uh, we'll begin with Sandra Clevin. Hi. Okay, hi. Um, jumping in a little bit late, I prepared a set that would begin with Leslie um, Freed's poem from her book, um, Lily is Leaving. But since she's had a chance to think about it, I'm going to, for my one poem, turn it over to her and let Leslie read and introduce her own poem. Hello, can you hear me okay? Um, this, uh, this book, Lily is Leaving, has um, various poems that have to do with a lot of family, family poems, uh, happiness, sadness, love. Uh, this poem is that I'm going to read is called Afterwards, and it's about the time uh, when I basically um, dropped the ashes of, of my uh, partner, uh, after his death, dropped them into Puget Sound in Seattle. And he was a poet named uh, Jesse Bernstein. So uh, this is called Afterwards. I remember your wish to drop my ashes over Puget Sound and make sure Hugo's the pilot. Hugo hasn't flown in years wears flip-flops, shades, and speaks a very sexy franglais. I pay for his license. The day arrives, the airport is deserted. Does it close for last rites? And where is the audience of ex-wives and lovers, mother, brother, kids, stepkids, bar buddies, and fellow poets? There is only me, and one troubled son. After a desperate run down the tarmac and a, and a thundering liftoff, we are swallowed into azure haze, the pint-sized plane flipping about like a tormented beach ball. But you, your ash body calm in sleep, nestle gently against my side in paper packets scented with rose petals. I slide open the tiny window and with a beating of wings inrush ancient worlds of mourning widows, hair flying upward, feet pointing down, women of a singular beauty with eyes of shell and lapis. They call me Habibi, lead me down teeming streets to the pyre where birds fly up and tell me to shake the ash, beat my breast, and wish you well as you fade into a circle of light, the collective dead. Hugo lights a cigarette. I don't have a speech, only mutter, thank you. I'm imagining your new home on the sea floor in the bellies of wolffish 
along with the sea urchins, cockles, and green crabs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie and Sandra. <laughs> Great to see you. And I'm looking forward to uh, so many of you here with your new books, getting you on to the queue for the new book showcase in the upcoming new year. All great to have some previews today of things, wonderful things to come. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Susan Abbott, just uh, coming off of your wonderful reading with um, and on uh, quintessential listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful um, conversation with um, Michael. He's a wonderful interviewer and I thoroughly enjoyed the time with him. Um, I read a poem from my new book, which is coming out in January. It's at the press, right? It's at the publishers right now being put together. It's a combination. I'm more known as an uh, artist, painter, drawer. And uh, so it's a combination of my art and poetry. Um, and so I'm going to read the poem Temperance, and I, it has a visual aid, which I'm going to hold up. I guess I put it on my nose. <laughs> um, this image, Temperance is a figure in the tarot deck. And uh, about five years ago, a friend of mine wanted to make a tarot deck of women artists who inspired her, and she invited me to be part of it. And um, we each, actually, I think a card chose us and temperance is what chose me. And I was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. I got that card. And I drew this image over a period of about two months and had like five or six different iterations of it. Um, and I was deciding which one would go to the deck. And this one won, uh, while I was making that decision that weekend, uh, the Pulse shootings happened at the Pulse nightclub. And so when that happened, I said, her wings got to be rainbow wings. So that's what I did. And that's the image. And so um, that, that came first. When we talk about what's your process, image, words, this was image first. And the and the it'd been talking to me for about five years, and about let's see in June I wrote this poem to go with it, so it's called Temperance. The pregnant air between water and fire gives rise to a cleansing steam, balance the world of death and desire. The temperate one sees the picture entire, one foot on land and one in the stream. Breath breathes pregnant air between water and fire. Her generous dignity all come to aspire. Her vision of a common dream balances the world of death and desire. So when tempers flare and escalate higher and just about burst at the seam, breathes pregnant air between water and fire. Her rainbow wings, her flowing attire, she shines as a dark light beam balances the world of death and desire. Let her measure the pulse, never deny her. May all the addictions come clean. The pregnant air between water and fire extinguishes the world of death and desire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan. Might be the first time that we didn't hear of Villanella or Sistina today that is a villanelle oh yeah that is a villanelle so we haven't <laughs> there you go there you go oh, my god it is, it is a villanelle so much for me today Oof. oh my gosh thank you so much all right we have scott norman rosenthal next and uh followed by yeah it's like villanelle even if i didn't get it Okay, uh, this one is old and short like its author. If the world had spun less fast, perhaps not quite as dizzily, 
I might have got on. I might have ridden the carousel, painted horse going round and up and down, plastered personality showing inanimate when all the music and the steed had stopped. Thank you so much, Scott. We're gonna have Lori Wolf, and then I'm gonna sneak in Meg McLeod right at the end. And that will take us to the 90 minutes, I think, and uh, a, a, a very full, robust reading for today. Thanks, Lori. Okay, thank you, Sandy, for including me today. This is my first time here and uh, I'm honored to be among the group of wonderful poets today. So thank you for your welcome. Uh, this poem was written after several years of writing elegies for my husband who passed away. And this one really turned a corner for me. It's called Yellow Swallowtail. After a year of gray veils, clutching my loneliness like a rosary rubbed smooth and familiar, today a yellow swallowtail lights on the milkweed that has at last bloomed, it, bloomed its pink fist open, a pale planet bobbing atop a thin green tower. I have for years cut down this juicy stem, thinking it's an invasive weed among my purple salvia, till a green-thumbed friend described its magnetic effect on the butterflies. I let it grow. And this year, a giant flutter, a flit of butter gold, filigreed with black lacework, alights and flexes. The wings pulse, pulse, a rhythm matching my heartbeat. Silently it moves from blossom to blossom, sipping life. I barely breathe lest it disappear. Could anything be more alive in this moment? The yellow glow brings me home to midsummer, to rippling heat. With joy so full, there is no room for yesterday's grieving here. Today, I make a choice to praise. Emerging from sorrow's cocoon, I re-enter the world of beating sun, milkweed, and butterfly. Each of us awakened our new wings testing the wind. Thank you. Thank you all. What a, what a great first reading to introduce yourself to us today. Uh, welcome, Lori Wolf, and we're going to end. Uh, it's, it's been so great to have some new voices join us today, um, along with friends that have been reading since we started in March and so uh, 2020, of 2020. So I'm really glad to close today with Meg McLeod. Welcome, Meg. Hello. It's good to be here, and it's lovely to hear all your poems. Thank you for letting me read. This one is The Counting of My Days. Days. 27,000 or thereabouts, my heart beating its way from child to crone. Many shades of womanhood, breaking. Mending, fluttering, grieving, emerging, seducing, succumbing. Birthing two new hearts to hold close, to cherish and set free. 27,000 days, my dear heart has climbed the mountains to fall into shadows, surfacing like the whale for air. And while the heart rests beneath the touch of an angel's wing, the chrysalis begins to break. What are those pinions forming? Is my heart getting ready to soar on its own wings? Thank you.
Well, what a perfect way to close our reading for today, soaring, questioning whether we're ready to soar, our own hearts soaring on those wings. And I feel like that's what we've been gifted today from all of the poets who read. I want to uh, remind you that in today's live open mic, we heard at the top of the last hour from Giulio Magrini, Mary Louise Kiernan, Bill Nevins, Matt Mooney, Phil Lynch, Kellyanne Parker, Lenora Good, Mick Meza, Larry Kirshner, Ann Tweedy, Kim Ports Parsons, Don Krieger, Leslie Freed, Susan Abbott, Scott Norman Rosenthal. And we close with Meg McLeod in our, off our wait list. We got as many voices in today as we could. Thank you all. And let's, let's uh, unmute ourselves and show our appreciation for the ways we all took flight today. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, Thank you, everyone. Beautiful. I want to just remind you all. Oh, you got muted. Muted. <laughs> muted. Up and coming. There we go. Up there I am. There I am. I'm back. Um, <clears throat> trickster energy is what I call that. A little trickster <laughs> energy today. Mm -hmm. I didn't pick up on the villanelles quite so fast and they're muting. Um, anyway, everyone, um, if you have any upcoming readings this week or anything you want to share, uh, feel free to put those in the chat uh, as I'm just reminding you that we will return next Sunday for our fourth reading of the month of October. The second and fourth Sundays are always our new book showcase and we'll be welcoming the poetry of Ashley M. Jones, Elizabeth Levinson, Karen, Karen Poppy, and Judith Kerman. They will be here on stage with us. That's next Sunday, 12. Pacific, three Eastern. That of course is eight o'clock over in Ireland in the UK. And I can't do all the time zones, my friends, <laughs> but uh, do them, you know, get your time converters out and join us uh, back here next Sunday for our new book showcase. And of course, in October, we have a bonus reading and it happens to fall on Halloween. And uh, we will be having our trick or treat reading, a costume party, come dressed as you will and uh, bring your poetry uh, for the live open mic for that reading on Halloween, bring your tricks and treats. Um, and we'll have a few features joining us. Cindy Veach and um, Claire Kelly will be joining us with some of their poetry from the Salem Witch Trials and poems inspired by horror films. So that will be Sunday, Halloween for me afternoon um, on October 31st. Well, as I share with you every week, um, I'm always so grateful for everyone who assembles and is able to join us. So great to see um, uh, folks that, 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 have, that have been with us from the early weeks of uh, Cultivating Voices, um, able to join us when they can. And of course, uh, our, 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 we welcome our new members as well and always love hearing um, the new voices and poetry. Thank you so much to Kim Ports 
Parsons for encouraging the theme of wings today, as well as to Don Krieger for supporting the tech side of things here. Uh, all I, we could not do the program without their incredible support, nor could we have these gatherings without the incredible support of all of you. So I wish you a very good week. And I remind you that our humanity depends on our deepest of listening. Keep, uh, keep listening out there, my friends. And of course, keep writing your remarkable poems. Have a great week. Guys rock. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thanks, Smith. Be well. Bye.